I know uh, quite a few of you were still up at 2 a.m. packing it out out there. So I've been really appreciating the sense of the, of the flow of adrenaline in this room as we've been worshiping. Uh, maybe it's from coffee, but I think for most of you, it's because of the, the work, the power of the Holy Spirit in your lives. So no matter how little sleep you have, you're still alive to Christ. And that's going to make my job, the things I want to share here, so much easier. Um, you know, we've all gone through an historic moment this week with the uh, passing of Billy Graham. Uh, the New York Times said this week that apart from the Apostle Paul, Billy Graham may have had the greatest impact on, on global Christianity at any single person in the last 2,000 years. And if you ask the question, how to, to go with our theme for this weekend, how did this person turn the world upside down? Those of us who worked with him and knew him could answer that very easily. It was because his life, his world, had been radically turned upside down by his vision of the greatness and glory, the majesty and the supremacy, the, the wonders of the love and the saving power of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the explanation. But it doesn't have to be true just of someone who's more like a celebrity Christian. This past week, uh, three or four days ago, I was in the south side of Chicago working with pastors who are ministering in one of the most difficult urban segments of a city anywhere in the United States. It's where most of the shootings go on. It's where most of the crime goes on in Chicago. And these pastors have small congregations who are doing a mighty work. They're ministering on the streets to drug addicts and uh, to gangs and to prostitutes. Uh, in fact, one of their common experiences is conducting memorial services for some young man that's just been shot in a gang uh, encounter. And, 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 the, and the church will be filled with lots, maybe hundreds of other young people who are coming for the service and hearing the gospel for the very first time. These people are turning the world upside down. And as I met with them, even though I've been sent to teach them, I was there to learn from them because I learned that the same thing about Billy Graham was true about every one of those pastors. And that is their lives had been radically, their worlds, their own worlds had been radically turned upside down by the, the vision of the greatness and glory and majesty and supremacy and the wonders of the love and saving power of the Lord Jesus Christ. There's no other explanation for how it happens. And, uh, you know, this... Um, Last few days, I've sort of had an experience of deja vu for me as we watched uh, students, high school students primarily, uh, sort of rising up and, and beginning to create a movement in, in relationship to the issue of gun control. But it takes me back to the years when I was caught up in another massive student movement in this country, the anti-Vietnam War era, when literally millions of students were marching on campuses and in the streets. And uh, I pastored a church adjacent to Kent State University, a church that had uh, quite a few students in it. That's why I was standing on the campus the day I watched uh, National Guard troops turn and fire live bullets into a, into a crowd of students killing four and wounding and maiming and even paralyzing about 18 others. And that was an event that changed the course of history and the course of events on the other side of the globe. That was the breaking point. And those of us in the church, we realize we're in the midst of revolution, and we do not know what to do. So we finally felt the Father was calling us into a, a level of prayer none of us had ever known before. I suppose I may have prayed five or ten minutes at a time, but it was about it. I was the pastor. But we felt he was calling us into six weeks of prayer, four nights a week, two hours a night, how do we get through all of that? Well, we decided, we, since we had six weeks the Father had called us to, we're going to pray through the six chapters of Ephesians, and one chapter for each of the six weeks. And each of the four nights we'd get together, we would reread the chapter for that week, talk about it just a little bit, but mostly get down on our knees with our Bibles open before us on our chairs and try to do the best we could to fill the rest of the two hours with prayer, with one guideline, and that was this, that anything you pray must somehow be brought out of the passage for this week. Maybe a promise, maybe a, some kind of a theological statement, or maybe just an implication of something that's in that, in that chapter. But let your prayers come out of Scripture. I can tell you that because of what happened in that prayer meeting, 
we experience something of what we read about in, First Thess- or in Acts chapter 17 about the church in Thessalonica. We saw our world turned upside down. Over the ensuing years before I left there, we saw all the campus groups, the Crusade and Navigators, InterVarsity, Chi Alpha, all the other, they came together like never before they worked together. We literally saw hundreds of students on a campus of about 22,000. We saw hundreds of students come to Christ over the next few years. And we know it was a direct result of what went on in that prayer meeting. But wait a minute. The revolution of that prayer meeting, of all revolutions, is what happened in all of us who worked through those six weeks. Because you see, the book of Ephesians is really a glorious portrait of who Jesus is and what he's up to right now. And there's nothing that changes your life more powerfully than if you take God's word, put it into your mouth, turn it into prayer, send it up to the throne, because God will turn around and send that very vision of your praying back into your heart, and he'll begin to transform your life by the very prayers you're praying, let alone all the answers that ultimately come. And I tell you, I am standing here this morning because of that prayer meeting, because that's where the Holy Spirit began to turn my world upside down with a much greater vision of the Lord Jesus Christ, of his majesty, of his supremacy, of the wonders of his love and his saving power. But you know, it isn't just what happened on one campus a few years ago. One of my favorite professors over the years in my graduate studies was Dr. J. Edward Noren, historian, who had three earned doctorates, one from UCLA, one from uh, Oxford University, and one from Serampore University in Calcutta. And all of his doctoral studies was on the history of spiritual awakenings. His dissertation at UCLA was on a study of 300 years of Christian campus movements around the world and what the impact and results of all of that was. And when his dissertation was published in a more popular form, he entitled the book, Campus Aflame. And and he used that phrase because what he discovered in his research, including many of the campuses in this room and campuses around the world, is that God would bring students together, radicalize them, with a much larger vision of Christ, give them a sense of what his mission was all about. And before they were done on that campus, they were already beginning to be used by the Holy Spirit, not only to turn the world of their campus upside down, but their whole generation ultimately. For example, if you go to Williams College in Williamstown, Massachusetts, I don't know if you've ever been there, there's a huge monument in the center of the campus with a big globe of the world on top. Do you know that monument is actually on the very spot because one of the participants 50 years later was able to find it on the very spot where five students in 1806 who had been involved in a prayer movement on their campus found themselves in prayer in the midst of a thunderstorm. (laughs) And it was in that moment that the Spirit of God brought everything to a conclusion of where he had been taking them all along and gave them a vision, 1806 now, of how God could use them to stir up an international missionary movement out of North America. And within four years, not only had they done so, but some of them actually were sent as the very first missionaries ever sent out of North America. So how about your campus? What would it look like for your group on campus to really be aflame in such a way that it turned upside down the world of your campus and ultimately a whole generation. God has done it before. He is no respecter of persons. What he's done for others, he is not only able, not only willing, but may I say to you this morning, he is ready to do it on your campus in ways, as Paul says, that will be exceedingly abundantly above and beyond anything you can ask or think. Which brings me back to the church in Thessalonica. Because that's Acts 17, it was there in that city where people were using that phrase, these are those who are turning the world upside down. Literally in the Greek it says these are those who are agitating, who are creating revolution all over the world. I want to give you a secret verse for a moment. It's a secret, not because it's not in the Bible, it is. It's a secret because it's a secret to most believers. 
If they've ever read it, they've probably skimmed right over it. But it is the most important verse I could give you here this morning. It's about the church in Thessalonica. And it was written in a letter, the second Thessalonians in our New Testament, that was written about, uh, uh, about one year after the, the work of a new church began in Thessalonica under the leadership of Paul. And this verse that is a secret to most people is one of the great promises you can take out of this conference this week back to your campus and you can depend on it. Because here's what Paul says. 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 1. He says, pray for us that the word of God may spread rapidly and be honored in every place just as it was with you. Now you can just read right over that and never even think about it. Just keep on reading. What a powerful statement. Now, I assume at this point when Paul writes it, you know, he's been out in Christian ministry for, for a couple of decades now. Uh, he's walked with the Lord Jesus many, many years. If there was ever a spiritual giant, if there was ever a world changer, it was, uh, it was the Apostle Paul. So if he gives me a prayer request, he's probably telling me to pray for something he's absolutely sure is what God wants to do. And we know we're told in the scriptures in 1 John that if we pray anything according to his will, he hears us. And we also know that if he hears us in whatever we pray, we have what we've asked of him. So Paul is giving us a prayer request. I'm convinced he was sure the Father wanted to answer. And what was that request? That God would do every other place what he did in Thessalonica. And essentially, he defines it in two ways, that the word of Christ spread rapidly. It penetrated. It was powerful. It doesn't mean that everybody accepted it, but he goes on to say, and was honored. In other words, there was a sense that there's a reality here we've got to come to terms with on the part of the unbelievers who were hearing that message. Paul says, I believe God wants to do in every other city I visit exactly what he had done in Thessalonica a year before. So what happened in Thessalonica a year before? How was their world turned upside down? And is it possible that Paul is telling us that what happened in Thessalonica in Acts 17 is exactly what God wants to do on your campus the rest of this year and then in the years to come? Well, walk with me back into 1 Thessalonians, just the first chapter. It was written just six months. I don't know how old your campus fellowship is. I don't know how many new believers there are involved in it, but this is a brand new group with a whole bunch of brand new believers. And Paul writes back to them six months later after it all began. And here are some of the things, you can read this on your own later uh, today if you want, but 1 Thessalonians chapter one. Here are some of the things he says about them. He says, the gospel came to them in the power of the Holy Spirit and with full conviction. So they were overtaken with the glory and the, and the saving power of Jesus Christ right from the get-go and with such power that they were full of conviction. In other words, they were unwavering. They were committed. This was a, a lifetime adventure that they were on. He goes on and says in 1 Thessalonians 1, I see in you the work of faith, the labor of love, and the steadfastness of hope. And then he ends, in our Lord Jesus Christ. So their faith was already producing fruit. Their love was already being spread. Their lives were filled with hope and anticipation of all God was getting ready to do. And it was all wrapped up in the Lord Jesus Christ and who he was and who he is. And Paul goes on to say and describe some of what was going on. He said, you turn from idols to serve the living and true God. Now, that, you could just read over that and not think about it. They, these people had worshiped idols up to now. This was their safety. This was their insurance. To turn from your idols, to, to pull it off the God shelf, to throw it away, you're risking everything that whatever you're putting in their place is, is far more certain to, to bring the blessing and the, and the safety and protection that your life demands, deserves, and they were willing to tear down their idols right from the beginning, and to turn, he said, and serve. In other words, these are active Christians. These aren't passive Christians to serve the living and true God. They had come to know, and to say he's true, they're understanding something of his nature. To say he's living means that they're, they're living, serving him in the sense that they're always in his presence. But he doesn't stop there. 
to serve the living and true God. And then he ends by saying, and to wait for his son from heaven, Jesus Christ, whom he raised from the dead, who delivers us from the judgment to come. Now, that might sound like, Paul is saying, that what they've done now is they're, they're just waiting for the second coming, waiting to get this all over, waiting to escape out of this world. That's not what he means at all. What he means is that they've turned from these idols, thrown them away. They're now living for the, for the true God. And he says, their lives are so wrapped up in the greatness and glory, the majesty and supremacy, the wonders of the love and saving power of Jesus Christ, that they're living just for him, for his kingdom, for his triumphs, for his victory. They understand that everything's gonna be consummated in him. They understand that everything at this very moment is moving to be summed up under him as Lord. And they're just living every day in the light of that reality. These are people who are obsessed with the glory of Christ. That's what he means. And as a result of all these characteristics I've just described for you, Paul says in the first chapter, so that the gospel rings out from you. Actually, the Greek word is, it trumpets out like the, the blast of a horn. So the gospel rings out from you, he says, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but on beyond. So that, he says, wherever I end up going, people are already talking about what's going on in Thessalonica. Now, let me just remind you, this is six months later. And not only has their world been turned upside down by the power and glory of Christ, by their consuming passion for the Son of God, but as a result of that, these brand new Christians, they didn't even have a New Testament, you understand? Because it hadn't been written yet. Living in the power of the Holy Spirit, here they are actually proclaiming Christ as a community. He's being made known not only Macedonia, Achaia, but Paul adds, and beyond. We have no idea how far it went. And I want to say to you here this morning, as someone who's worked with campus movements around the world for decades, I want to say to you this morning, I'm here because I'm absolutely convinced that this is exactly, in terms of the characteristics and in terms of the, the ultimate outcomes, this is exactly what the Father wants to do for his Son in your campus fellowship as well. And if you were to say to me, well, wait a minute, where do we begin? What is, is there a secret behind this secret? This secret that we're to be praying for, what's the secret behind the secret? And I go back to Acts 17, and I read a couple of phrases. I read that when Paul was in the synagogue, he preached Jesus as Messiah. I read that when he was preaching among the, the pagans in the city, he preached Jesus Christ is king. Do you see what a, his message, even when he's talking to unbelievers, before they have ever come to even a simple childlike faith in Christ, his message is already large because his Jesus is so large. So when he gets to the Jews, he preaches Christ as Messiah. They knew what that meant. It meant this, that this Jesus is the one God has anointed, the one you've been waiting for all of your generations to be anointed in order to fulfill all the prophecies and promises and purposes that God's been telling you about for all these generations. He's the one who's been anointed to be the ultimate prophet and priest and king. He's the one anointed and seated at the right hand of the Father whose rule and reign is going on actively at this very moment. That's what he preached in the synagogue. And he meant the very same things when it says he preached Jesus as king. In the Greek, the word king is literally emperor. He was basically saying, as an act of treason practically, that Caesar is not Caesar, Jesus is Caesar. Like it says in Revelation chapter one, Jesus is the ruler of the kings of the earth and that's going on at this very moment as well. That was the kind of vision Paul preached. So when these people were converted, they were converted to a very large Jesus right from the get-go. And then however much time Paul spent in Thessalonica discipling them and building them, I have to believe he was pouring into them that same kind of vision so that when he finally left, they were so captivated by the supremacy of the living, reigning Lord Jesus Christ that it created a dynamism in their life together that could not be contained. Dr. John R.W. Stott, 
who next to Billy Graham was probably the foremost influence on global Christianity around the world in the latter half of the 20th century. He was a Britisher. He traveled every part of the body of Christ in every nation of the world. He wrote many, many books. His last book that came out shortly before he died in 2010 was entitled The Radical Disciple. And if anybody knew what that meant, I would think he would. The radical disciple. What did he mean by the radical disciple? In his opening chapter, he says, the only hope for the church in this generation, and these are his words, is that we regain a vision of the supremacy of Jesus Christ. And then he says, that, says this, the problem with the church today is we have become pygmy Christians because we have a pygmy Christ. So if you were to say to me, how could my campus fellowship become a whole new force for the kingdom of God? The answer is to start filling each other with a whole new vision of the greatness and glory and majesty and supremacy of the wonders of the love and saving power of Jesus Christ. What kind of vision did Paul give them? What kind of vision should we be giving to each other? Well, listen for a moment, if you would, just sit back, relax. Let me share with you a little bit of what he wrote to the Colossians, which I'm sure summarizes the way he worked with the Thessalonians as he prepared them for the day when he was gonna leave. He says, for example, just to give you a sense of his, his vision of a Christ who was anything but pygmy, he writes in Colossians chapter one, Christ is the image of the invisible God. He is the firstborn of all creation, for by him all things were made in, in heaven and earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or powers or rulers, all things were made for him, uh, by him and for him, and in him all things hold together. He is also the head of the church. He is the beginning. He is the firstborn from the dead. So that in everything he might have the supremacy. For it pleased the Father to have all of his fullness dwell in Christ and, and through him to reconcile everything back to himself. Things in heaven, things on earth, making peace by his blood shed on the cross. And a few verses later, Paul says... This is the riches of the gospel, that this Christ is in the midst of you, the hope of all the glorious things to come. So him we proclaim, teaching everyone and admonishing everyone that we might present everyone complete in Christ. And to this end, I labor with all the energy God can mightily inspire within me. Hallelujah. But that isn't just for Paul, my brothers and sisters. Paul is giving himself as an example of how we should minister to one another. You say, how do you know that? Well, because in Colossians chapter 3, verse 16, listen carefully, Paul says to the Christians in the church in Corinth, or in Colossae, he says to them these words, let the word of the Christos, you know, whenever you see the word Christ in your new, I hope... After, after this morning, I hope it changes how you see every verse when you come across the word Christ, because that's not his last name. If he was here right now physically, I wouldn't introduce him as Mr. Christ. No, that, that, that's his title. That, like Mr. President, you saw, that's his title. And so every time the word Christ is used in a, in a passage in the New Testament, it's reflecting on whatever that passage is about in relationship to the greatness of who Jesus is right now in the fullness of his supremacy as he rules and reigns. You know, it says in Ephesians chapter four, it says, he who descended is the same one who ascended high above all things so that he might fill the universe, fill the universe. He is right now actively filling the universe, filling it with his glory, filling it with his power, filling it with his supremacy, filling it with his presence, filling it with his activity. And it's not just the universe. He wants to do and is doing the very same thing on your campus and what's needed on your campus isn't that the glory and presence and power of Jesus Christ would be present. It's there. What's needed on your campus is the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. And that's why you're there, to, to live in the reality of that knowledge yourself till it turns your world upside down so powerfully that it begins to do the same for the whole campus as people wake up to see 
who's already there and in charge, the Lord Jesus Christ. So Paul says to the, the, the church of Colossae, let this word of Christ, verse 16, chapter three, let this word of Christ dwell in you richly as you teach and admonish one another. Notice with me for a moment, he uses the words teach and admonish, exactly the words he used of his own ministry in chapter one, when he says, Christ we proclaim, teaching and admonishing everyone that we might present everyone complete in Christ. Now he's saying to the Colossians, I want you to do the same thing I did with you when I was with you. I want you to now do that with each other because he said, the most important thing, listen to me, the most important thing that could ever happen in the life of your Christian fellowship the most important thing that ever happened with those Christians in Colossae is that they would talk to each other and build up in each other a larger and larger vision of the Lord Jesus Christ. So much so, Paul says, let it dwell in you, dwell like it, it occupies, it, 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 it's, it's prevalent, it's, it's the center of attention. Let it dwell in you richly, richly means let it saturate you, let it get down into every facet of your life individually and your life together. And that's how your world gets turned upside down. That's how you become a person in a group that begins to turn the rest of the world upside down down. It is as true as day follows night, and it's waiting to happen on your campus right now. So, therefore, go back and pray. And you could say it a thousand different ways, but pray that the message of Christ, that it will spread rapidly and be honored in your lives and the life of your campus just as it happened in Thessalonica. So that if we're not pygmy Christians and we don't have a pygmy Christ, then we won't have a pygmy impact on the world either. I want to end by telling you a story of something going on just up the road. In the last... Um, Last 10 years, I've had the privilege of working inside one of the most famous maximum security prisons in the country. It's famous because it's been used in a lot of movies, not the least of which recently was Ocean's Eleven. But inside are about 2,000 what society would call hardened criminals, many of them serving life sentences, many of them for very violent acts, to be sure. But there is a movement of the Holy Spirit going on inside that prison You'd have to see it to believe it, I imagine. There are hundreds of inmates who are not only coming to Christ, but who are so zealous for Christ. I wish you could be there with me on a Sunday evening worship service. Um, we, we move into a time of worship that you know, would probably make all of us put to shame when we see the, the enthusiasm, the passion by which they're worshiping the Lord Jesus Christ. It'll go on for over an hour. They have their own band of about 12, 13 instruments. They have their own choir, about 14 voice, or 40 voice choir, and a, a couple hundred men sitting out there, and we just, we just worship our hearts out. Why is that? Because they have been possessed by this greater vision of Christ. Anyway, about five, six years ago, when I was speaking to them one evening, I said, men, you know, there's, a, there's something special going on here, and, and I, I sort of feel like we need a vision statement. Does your campus fellowship have a vision statement? Well, this is the one I proposed for the, for the inmates, the brothers inside East Jersey State Prison. I said, here, how, just try this on for, to see how it feels. And the vision is this, that East Jersey State Prison will become as famous for Christ as Wall Street is for money, Pittsburgh is for steel, and McDonald's is for hamburgers. They loved it. So I taught it to them, we worked it back and forth, and then we all recited it together. And many times since then, when I'm there, before I speak, I might say, Hey, let, let's do our vision statement together, and we'll, we'll recite it. The East Jersey State Prison will become as, well, actually, they've changed it. They've changed it. Will become more famous for Christ than Wall Street is for money, Pittsburgh is for steel, and McDonald's is for hamburgers. How about that for a vision statement for your Christian Union Fellowship on your campus? If you, if you don't want to do the McDonald's part, just go with the first part. Maybe go with a phrase. 
famous for Christ. Because that's what happened in Thessalonica. They became famous for Christ on into Macedonia, Achaia, and beyond in six months. And my God is no respecter of persons. When he's done for others, he is able, he is willing, and hallelujah, he is ready to do for you. It's not that we are to be purpose-driven Christians, though we are. It's not that we're to be passion-driven Christians, though that needs to come. First of all, we have got to be person-driven Christians, driven with a vision of the greatness and glory and majesty and supremacy of the wonders of the love and saving power of our reigning and ruling Lord Jesus Christ. And let that vision reconvert you and turn your world upside down and then all the rest will follow. Now, I've been asked to take the next 15 minutes and lead us in a time of prayer related to what I've just shared. And I'm gonna ask you to do something that I've done with students all over the world, with small groups, with large groups. I remember one time doing what I'm gonna do with you, doing it with 70,000 university students in the Olympic Stadium in Seoul, Korea, in a driving rainstorm, and they still went ahead and did it. So I don't imagine, you know, we're all comfortable here. This ought not to be too threatening. Let me explain to you what we're gonna do, because it's gonna put you on the spot a little bit. In just a moment, I'm gonna ask you to stand, and whatever you need to do, to find two other people and create a prayer triplet. Now, Matt tells me you've done this kind of thing before, but I'm gonna modify it just a little. Now, it's easy if one row turns to another and the next row to the next and the next to the next, uh, in many cases, and then you just get into threes and clump, clump together. But to do your very best to keep it in groups of three. And once you're in the group of three, I'm gonna have you number off, one, two, three. And then <clears throat> I'm gonna lead us in three cycles of prayer. And each of you, one, two, three, will get 30 seconds to pray. <laughs> now, for some of you, that may mean one sentence, and, and then everybody just is quiet till I say, all right, number two, you begin. And then I'll say, number three, you begin. Now, some of you may be praying your hearts out and be halfway through the prayer you wanted to pray, and I'll break in. Don't, don't feel like suddenly everything just fell apart. God heard the prayer you prayed. He knows the rest of it in your heart, but let your next friend next door to you uh, have a chance to get a word in edgewise. So, uh, and, and, and there may be a point where you're, you're in a prayer group and you're, you just don't know exactly what to pray in your 30 seconds, and you can just say, I'm not sure, and let's just worship the Lord or whatever you want. I mean, 30 seconds goes by, so I don't want anybody uh, in any way to feel put on the spot. First time around, we're gonna ask you to pray for yourself and let two people agree with you on this prayer who may never have prayed with you like this and for this with you before. And you know what Jesus said, where two or three are gathered in my name, you know, it'll be released out of heaven. So there, there's something really special in what you're about to do. First time around, each of you pray for yourselves that God, in whatever ways you wanna say it, that God would revolutionize your life and turn your world upside down with a whole new, grander vision of the Lord Jesus Christ, a spirit-given revelation of who he is that just grips you and turns you into a person-driven Christian, driven by the person of God's Son. So each of you get 30 seconds. Next time around, sort of the same kind of prayer, but now pray it for the, your campus fellowship, the, the students you came with, others who weren't able to, to make it, for, for God to do a new work in that fellowship that looks a little bit like what happened in Thessalonica and that in turn begins to turn your world upside down and then the campus and beyond as a result. Then the third time around, I want you to pray for your campus that God would do what he did in Thessalonica. I mean, you have Jews coming out of the synagogue. It says, it says in that chapter 17 of Acts, it says many prominent women. In other words, women of high society. And it says not a few prominent women joined in. And then, of course, all the pagans coming out of all forms of idolatry. So um, the diversity of your campus is, is not a challenge, it's a wonderful opportunity. Let's just pray then that there will be a work of the Holy Spirit on your campus and each of you get 30 seconds. When we finish that third cycle, I'll call us back to attention. And then I'm gonna ask you to pray 
in a way you may or may not have prayed before. It's the way most Christians pray around the world if, you, if you're in churches in Latin America or, or Africa or, or Asia. And for about a minute or two, I'm going to invite you to pray all together out loud simultaneously. And your focus of prayer at that point will be for our nation. Our nation has never been in such a desperate need for what I call a Christ awakening, for God to do nationwide what he did in Thessalonica. And we're praying for your generation. You know, this is the world ahead of you that needs to be brought into a new reality of who Jesus actually is, beginning in our churches all across the land and on beyond that. So let's, let's pray simultaneously, out loud together. Let's, let's join our voices. And if, if that feels awkward to you, you can just be quiet. That's all right. But if you'd like to join in, don't pray so loud the people on either side you can't concentrate. But, you know... If, the, the sense that we're an army together, shoulder to shoulder, in prayer for a whole new work of the Lord Jesus Christ, a, a Christ awakening across this land. And when I call us out of that prayer, the final prayer we're going to pray is, is a prayer of the Bible that we often read and never know what it means because it's, it's the transliteration of the Hebrew, and it's the word Hosanna. But the Hebrew Hosanna, that word actually means, and it, it, it's a cheer, it's actually a cheer, like they said when Jesus came into Jerusalem, Hosanna, they were cheering for him for what they anticipated he was about to do, though they didn't quite understand it at that moment, what it was actually going to be. The word Hosanna means, Lord, save us now. So I'm going to say at the end of the simultaneous prayer, all right, come back together. I'd like you to join me. Let's say it together. Hosanna, and we'll say it three times. W would you try it with me right now, how it feels to shout it out into the very throne room of heaven on the count of three? One, two, three. Hosanna. Excellent. And I bet you it's going to be twice that loud by the time, because what we're basically saying is all the prayers we have just prayed for ourselves, our groups, our, our campuses, our nation, all of these prayers now. We want you to come, Lord Jesus. That's the last prayer of the Bible, incidentally. Come, Lord Jesus. We want you to come now and be, be, not only bring an answer, be the answer to all we've just prayed. And after the last hosanna, we'll end with a benediction, which you'll repeat after me, phrase by phrase. <laughs> 